I think we will go ahead and get started here. So welcome, everyone. We're thrilled to have you join us today, and thank you for uh, spending some of your afternoon with us. Hi, I'm Brian. As noted, I'm a recovering banker. I did that for 36 years, but I've been clean for the last eight. Congratulations. Marketing is a lot more fun, just as complex, but much more optimistic. Marketers don't tend to like to talk about economic downturns. We know bankers do. Cutting budgets or workforce adjust adjustments. However, today we're going to do just that. Yeah, in general, us marketers would rather talk about growth and upturns, but realistically, marketing can actually be more impactful when the economic environment is uncertain or maybe even a little bit grim. If I could predict what the economy would do, I don't think I'd be on this webinar right now. Reception in the Bahamas isn't the best for that right now or in northern Canada. However, with the Federal Reserve's unprecedented rate hikes and trying to and they're trying to engineer a soft landing, something that's never been done successfully in the past, we as marketers and strategists need to be prepared for all outcomes. But first, just a step back and a general disclaimer. So no one, not even your favorite psychic, not even Brian, can tell you exactly what your organization should do in a recession or in an economic downturn. Uh, this presentation is going to be about 25 minutes, and it's fueled by a lot of themes found across many articles and studies that covered recessions from 2008 on backwards. But marketing has evolved a lot since 2008. So just a little time capsule here. In 2008, Google business profiles weren't yet a thing. Everyone was still going to mapquest.com, printing out the directions, and then really hoping that you didn't get lost because there was no voice that would say rerouting. No, you were just lost and then you had to go talk to a human. Reviews weren't everywhere like they are today. Nowadays, any consumer product, I expect I can find a review on it. And most B2B products, I expect I can find reviews on. Back in 2008, they were just starting to gain momentum. Amazon had them, but not everyone else. They weren't ubiquitous. YouTube was about three years old and Blu-ray had just won the high definition battle. So everyone who had HD DVDs was sad. I'm sure all of us have a few Blu-rays still rattling around. The iPhone was one year old. So it barely had an app store. It was on not even 3G at that point. Everyone thought that netbooks, those little miniature computers, those were gonna be the next big thing. And Brian, I think you were probably on the cutting edge with your little Blackberry and a little leather holster on your belt, huh? Absolutely, that was me. And then maybe the most impressive is Elon Musk had actually not joined Twitter before 2009. All of this is to paint the example that we're really in uncharted waters right now as we're navigating our way to the next normal. And guess what? We're always in uncharted waters. But even in uncharted waters, north is still north. And so today, what we'll be covering is a tried and true best practices that you need to keep in front of you as you plan for 2023 and beyond. In our research, these five commandments were recurring indicators of brands and organizations who emerged from economic downturns in fighting shape. In our recent experience, these fundamentals are also what mattered in the 2020 re recession. Well, our first commandment, know thyself, is a philosophical staple going way back to the ancient Greeks. But today we're talking about it in a business setting. You need to take this to an internal strategic level and be very objective about what your business could call an advantage and where your business might have a vulnerability. And we're not talking marketing specific. So if you're Apple, yes, your brand is a plus. Yes, everyone knows your logo. Everyone knows what your stores looks like and everyone knows that your products are cool. But possibly a more unfair advantage in a recession is that you've socked away more money than most small countries. That's a really nice way to go into an economic downturn. Yeah, absolutely. And as they say, cash is king, and it's hard to catch up with that one on short notice. Oh, maybe as an example that's a little bit more relevant to most of us, great customer service could be an advantage if you can back it out to more than we have good people who care. So great customer service as an advantage might mean that you have systems and technology in place that makes your responsiveness faster. It might mean that you have really robust training that helps drill everyone on how to answer a phone, how to add value to a customer and solve their problems and really ensures quality. 
If that's what you have as an advantage, that's great. If you're saying you have great customer service, but it could walk out the door if your competitor hired everyone, really what you have is institutional knowledge and good attitudes. That's not an advantage. So when we're talking about advantages, we're looking for things that are hard to copy that give you a leg up on the competition. And this is where we want to reinforce and weaponize. The flip side of that is vulnerabilities. We want to be aware of our vulnerabilities as a business. And very often those vulnerabilities are the flip side of an advantage. So when we're talking about customer service as an advantage, the downside, the vulnerability of that would be that in order to have those operational advantages that make you faster in order to have that stellar training that sets every service rep up for success. It's going to be a big part of your budget. You're going to be spending a lot of money for that advantage. And it might be a vulnerability if a competitor is able to go after your customers with a lower cost, lower touch self-service model that maybe provides overall less value and doesn't feel as good, but costs less and is a better fit for small wallets. As an example, in my past life at ING Direct, we were focused on a low friction, efficient, and effective approach to customer service. High touch on the things that really were critical, but high tech and more automated on routine transactional interactions. We built our tech stack around this, we trained our people around it, and it was the core of our value proposition. We had crazy customer loyalty and we were hard to copy. But if someone wanted the traditional hometown bank where you could get bad coffee and chat with the teller, we weren't competitive there and we weren't trying to be. We knew who we were and we stuck with it. You knew thyself. And that's really critical. The last thing you want to do in a downturn or recession is cut away the things that make your company what it is today. If you're a premium brand that differentiates yourself on quality, You don't want to turn around and release a cheap, crappy version to market and tarnish that reputation. And this has happened, and there are still companies out there that are fighting the reputation challenges they created for themselves by pivoting away from who they really were in the face of adversity. This work of knowing thyself will only get you so far, however. After all, marketing is a competitive sport. You also want to understand your competition as well as you possibly can, going beyond however you internally talk about them to actually being objective about their advantages and vulnerabilities. Who has the scale advantages when it comes to bargaining power and internal cost cutting? Who's running on legacy systems that will make operational efficiencies costly and difficult? And who's starting to edge into the market? Even if they seem silly right now, 20 years ago, as an example, Amazon was pretty much just selling books. Now they make or break consumer-facing product businesses, and we all rely on them. Next, make some hypothesis on how you think your industry and its players might react in an economic downturn. Will competitors go on the offensive and try to break into your customer base? Will they take the armad- or will they take the armadillo approach roll and roll up into a ball and cut everything they can cost-wise? What will happen upstream and downstream of you on the supply chain makes a difference. And is there any potential opportunity to be found there? An example of this is in 08, a friend of mine in the hot tub business saw other dealers around the nation going out of business due to sudden lack of demand and shrinking consumer wallets. What did he do? He acquired his competitor's inventory at 10 to 20 cents on the dollar and resold it for half of the sticker price. And he had some of the highest margins he'd ever experienced during and coming out of the recession. Once you start to understand likely courses of action, you can start to strategize the move after the next move. If they do X, you'll do Y. If they do Y, you'll do B. Don't go into this planning with a pen, but recognize that you will be in a better, you'll be better prepared to react simply because they've thought about it already. Understanding yourself, your company, your competitors, and the market landscape around you are all prerequisites to optimizing your marketing spend. You have to do those steps first, otherwise you're driving blind. Like a millennial trying to navigate with only a physical map. A what now? Yeah, Jeez. Okay. I have them at the state Thanks. fair. Thanks, Scout Leader Brian. All right, so once you have your hypothesis on what the market's going to do, 
you'll want to plan out potential courses of action. And an economic downturn, if customers are likely to buy less, you should definitely be proactive in tweaking your promotional mix. But not all marketing spend is equal. If you cut, you want to go in with a scalpel and not a hatchet. So to start thinking about that, we'll start with some broad definitions to help us categorize the different marketing spend we might see in a budget. So brand marketing is broad, top of funnel, brand defining marketing that's meant to help establish awareness and trust with your target market. I always think the Budweiser Super Bowl commercials, those aren't ever blaring, go buy our beer. Sometimes there's no beer in the whole commercial. Instead, what they're trying to do is get you to mentally link their brand with Americana and cute puppy Labradors and giant Clydesdales and this kind of bootstrap, you can do it sense of self. Like they're getting a feeling out there that you identify with their brand. Brand marketing is a long game. It's not an instant success story. It's hard to measure. You're rarely going to be able to trace a billion dollar commercial with Clydesdales back to how many bottles of Bud sold. But it is critical to sustain for the long-term health of your organization. It's what gives you a voice in the market. By contrast, direct marketing is end of funnel, call to action heavy marketing that's really meant to drive sales in the short term. It's usually specific to a product or service line. It's usually easier to measure ROI on, and it's much shorter term in impact. You expect to see the impact of that spend definitely within the same year, possibly within the same quarter. So examples of that would be like a special end of quarter promotion or a search ad on Google, or if someone's offering you $2 off a case of Budweiser, that would be direct marketing right there. All examples of direct marketing. And then there's one we don't hear a lot about. It's new since 2008. It's grown over the past 10 years or so. And this is what I call digital presence marketing. It's not advertising. It's all those little marketing things that have just accumulated that modern marketers are expected to keep track of and manage. So reviews, they're everywhere. You need to manage them. Social profiles, like it or not, you've probably got them. People mentioning you on social, search engine marketing, all of these little things are there whether or not you want them. You could turn off your Facebook page and try to remove it. It would probably be back in a few days after someone tagged you on Facebook. You could try to remove your Google listing. But you better raise your building to the ground. Otherwise, it's way more likely they'll mark you as permanently closed and really confuse all your consumers. So for better, for worse, over the last decade, marketing has come to include managing all these little pieces. So next, let's talk about how you actually optimize all this, which is Boy Scout motto, Brian. Be prepared. No, that's what it is. You need to be flexible and you need to be fast on your feet. You want to be able to plan ahead, but give yourself the ability to really react quickly to changing markets. So if you see that your competitors are reducing their advertising and marketing spend, it may actually be a good idea to crank up your brand marketing. What you'll see if you do that is that you have lower cost per click. It adds cost less when fewer people are buying them generally. When fewer people are buying them, You'll also have the greater ability to saturate the market. So you'll see increased share of voice for less money. And that will lead to greater share of market. So by spending more when other people are spending less on the brand marketing side, this can be a big advantage. And it can help you capitalize when repressed demand resurges post-recession. So if you think of how travel exploded post-COVID, that's a pretty common backward swing from any economic downturn. By retaining or even growing your brand awareness marketing, you're positioned to be top of mind with those consumers when the market does resurge and you paid less for it during the recession than you would have otherwise. On the flip side of that, direct marketing. When it's direct marketing, you want to be really on top of how your customers are responding. So brand marketing is a little bit more about what the market's doing and what your competitors are doing. Direct marketing is how is the end consumer reacting today? And if your consumers are not buying, if they're sitting on their hands and holding off on a purchase because they just don't feel comfortable, you'll probably want to reduce your direct marketing spend because you can't advertise your way to a sale. But you would still want to be consistent with the overall brand marketing. And then if you think of kind of complex product lines, if you're a business that has multiple services or multiple things for sale, the decision on direct marketing 
likely needs to be made at each line level. I'll go through an example of that in just a second here. Finally, for digital presence marketing, at some level, it's pretty much mandatory that you continue doing some of that work. You can optimize a little bit for costs, but it's not like media spend where the cost fluctuates on demand or where you're going to see a great discount because it's tight right now. It's basically when it comes to those tasks, those little things that you have to manage, it's labor and software or it's just labor. So an example could be review management. Maybe you're using something like Podium to help you ask for reviews, respond to reviews, and monitor your profile. You could get rid of the software. You could save yourself a hundred bucks a month, but you can't get rid of the work of having to do, having to go answer reviews, having to make sure no nasty reviews are sitting out there unanswered and making sure your profile is up to date. So you could decrease your software cost and increase your human costs. It's a teeter totter. So by sorting our marketing spend into these three buckets, now we're in a good position to cut or grow in real time. We want to understand where are we spending money? What do those contracts look like? Are we locked in or is it flexible month to month? What is that breakdown between brand and direct? What's our mix today? And what does it need to be going into the future? And then even just understanding where you do have stuff that you can level up or level down. Advertising, you can tweak pretty granularly. But something like web hosting is probably going to be pretty non-negotiable. You're not just going to turn off your website for a few months to save money. So you really want to understand where your money is going today. And then you'll be able to adjust that flow strategically instead of blindly. So the Spectrum Aeromed umbrella is an example of one of our customers with kind of four broad revenue categories. In a recession, they're likely going to see fewer sales of big equipment. So rotor wing, fixed wing, and specialty equipment. Those would be all big one-time purchases by someone who's retrofitting a plane or a helicopter. I would anticipate that market demand there will go down and that people will try to make their existing equipment last longer, which means that while those three revenue lines might decrease, it's really likely that people are going to see an increased demand for maintenance. So when they're thinking of their marketing mix, they want to keep that broad brand awareness marketing because people are going to get sick of using their old equipment for the next few years. They're going to be thinking, gosh, I need to update when I can. We want those people to think upgrade equals Spectrum Aeromed. But during that time when people aren't upgrading, they are maintaining and we want them to be aware of those services. So our spend would shift from supporting new big purchases to supporting maintenance services. And that's how we rebalance and think about our marketing spend. So there's another side to optimizing your marketing spend, and that's customer retention and referrals. And they should always be a dominant player in your in any marketing strategy, but it's even more important in an economic downturn. It costs less to retain than to acquire new customers. And the revenue generated from returning customers tends to grow over time. More money in for equal or less money out is usually what we aim for. And that is key. More money in than out. You want to retain profitable customers, not necessarily all customers. You want to ensure you've got your ideal customer profile well-defined and prioritized. And you want to look at how those customers and their industries will likely be impacted by and react to an economic downturn. Understanding how your customer will respond to a downturn will help you cater your marketing and offerings to retain them. It could mean a change in messaging to reflect a change in their optimism or stress levels. In some cases, maybe it means a slimmed down, lower tier product offering to fit slimmed wallets. You don't want, but you don't want to abandon your current customers with an abrupt shift in offering or messaging. Even if you think it may, be, may open up new customer segments, hold on to that bird in your hand. Finally, retention goes beyond marketing spend and into company strategy. Operationally, you need to be living up to the promises your marketing makes. At IMG Direct, our promise was a seamless, easy customer experience that met the customer anywhere they were at. If we dropped the ball by not investing in the technology it took to make that possible, we'd be liars and our customers would leave. Additionally, that investment in technology helped lower our costs during economic downturns. 
And by having your customer profile refined and solid, you knew that was going to be a good investment and that you weren't going to just throw money at the wall. You were going to continue to drive loyalty. So you relied on a stellar customer experience combined with frictionless incentivized customer referral program. And that drove real lasting growth in a way that made a really meaningful difference. Absolutely. Economic downturns panic businesses, individuals, and stock markets, and especially politicians. But you can't lose track of the long term. You do need to adapt to the short term reality, but it's a balancing act, not a prescription. So, Harvard Business Review has studied this, obviously. And they've identified six total approaches, three defensive, three offensive, and most organizations have some combination of these at play during a recession or economic downturn. They could be totally defensive, where they're just hunkering down, cutting costs, existing as a tiny sliver of the business they once were just to survive, and then hoping that they can grow on the other side. The flip side of that would be someone who's just spending like there's no tomorrow. They don't slow down anything. They ignore the market as it is, and they're just going blindly and blissfully into their day. And neither end of that spectrum is a good place to be. Instead, the ideal position is to balance operational efficiency with opportunistic strategic market development and asset investment. And there is one key reason that unites all of these. All three of these things give you advantages that sustain Yes, they have positive impact in a recession, but they are advantages that sustain outside of a recession as well. So your efficiencies gained in operations, to Brian's point about technology, those operational efficiencies don't end when the recession ends and the economy bounces back. The efforts you go to make operations cheaper when the economy is low, keep your operations low when the economy is buzzing and increase profitability. Sim similarly, market development and asset investment, those open up new opportunities now, but those new opportunities don't vanish when the market changes. They grow when the market changes. So if you're smart about the moves you make during a recession, those advantages can actually put you ahead of others who maybe hunkered down or maybe didn't change their behavior going into a recession. Uh, when you come out of it, you can be stronger. I think BI Business Review put it, an economic downturn presents equally as much a business opportunity as a threat. So really what you want to do is develop your agility now. Listen to and hold tight to your customers now and look for opportunities that are short-term and long-term in nature. The bottom line, it's possible to come out of an economic downturn stronger than you went into it. And that should be your North Star. So to wrap up today, here again are those five commandments, and they're in order. You need to start this process by really understanding your business, your company, what advantages you have, and what weaknesses you potentially have that you might need to guard a little bit. You want to understand your market and how it might react to an economic downturn, the upstream and downstream effects of it, and where that might present opportunities for your organization. You want to optimize your spend, which starts with understanding the money you're spending today, where it's going, what's flexible, and what's not. You want to know all the levers you have at your disposal. After that, you really want to make sure your focus is on retaining your existing customer base. Uh, you don't want to get distracted or panicked and start chasing shiny new things. Your customers today that you keep through the recession are the ones who will help you grow into the future as well. That should be the first impact of your marketing, and you should never cut into that. And then finally, all the decisions you make should be with the concept in mind that this too will end. It's called a swing for a reason. It goes one way, and then it goes the other way. It's never not come back. So the decisions you make need to be grounded in the reality that an upswing will come, and if you can position yourself well now and when, you'll be a winner overall. So... I know this was a fast-paced discussion. It was about a little under half an hour. If you've got questions or want to discuss further, please reach out to talk. If you want to uh, take these steps, but maybe you need a little help on the strategy or execution front, that's why data is here. We exist to help companies with this. So with that, we'll open it up for question and answers. And if not, I think Ryan will just give us advice on fish or something. Next week, that's what I'm going to be doing. This <laughs> All right. I don't think we have any questions at this point. I don't see any in chat. 
Uh, so quick before everyone logs off, thank you for joining us again today. Thank you for not taking a nap and instead joining this webinar.